that is found there. Three things. Let me mention the three of them. Um, I listened to the cross politic um, episode with Matt Walsh. Now, Matt Walsh is a Roman Catholic. He is a Roman Catholic. Now, I don't know how orthodox he is. I don't know how conservative he is. But anyone who's followed Matt Walsh for any period of time at all knows he hates Reformed theology. He hates the sovereignty of God and salvation. He rejects sola scriptura. Um, and so he is a Roman Catholic. We have a little experience in dealing with Roman Catholicism. Um, and I listened to the episode and I listened as the guys spoke about the gospel and about the Bible about the Bible being the word of God, uh, about bringing people to the gospel. Problem was, in the entire episode, never was it brought out. And by the way, Matt, um, do you still really think that Jesus is represented on the altar in a propitiatory sacrifice by a man who claims to be an altar Christus and that you receive partial forgiveness of your sins because of your attendance to a ceremony where you bow before that? Which, by the way, is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, he said a lot of stuff against um, uh, Pope Francis. That's fully understandable. There's lots of Roman Catholics to do. But the Roman Catholic gospel and what must be done in the sacramental system. Um, if you can read Galatians and then look at what Rome actually teaches on the gospel and go, mm, that fits, we're on another planet. Um you know, if we need to have that discussion, I've just met so many modern non-Roman Catholic evangelicals uh, who don't have a clue, don't have a clue what traditional Roman Catholic theology is, where that is today. I, I recognize there are so many in the Roman communion who do not, do not, do not believe what Rome teaches. That doesn't mean that there is a new teaching that's taken its place. There is still a Roman Catholic orthodoxy, even if the Bishop of Rome doesn't have to profess it. The other Bishop of Rome guy did, even though with a modern spin on it, I would say, on some levels. Uh, Ratzinger is who I'm referring to. But anyway, uh, it, was a, it was frustrating to listen to the discussion because the foundations had not been laid. And there's a, there's a chasm. You know, on, on the one hand, I'm listening to the Reformed guys talking about the gospel is the power of God and the centrality of Scripture and the nature of Scripture. And I'm sitting there going, Matt doesn't believe any of those things. So you can sit there and talk to him until the cows come home, but you're using a different lexicon. It, it's a little bit like talking to a Mormon it that way. There, there's, a, there's a different set of meanings attached to these things. And you, you've got to know that you've, it, or, or nothing's going to be accomplished. And so I wrote some questions on Twitter. It started to get a little bit of a response before the program started. There may be something going on on Twitter right now that I don't, I'm not watching. I only have so, many, uh, so much space here uh, to be able to do so. And this, this issue would definitely uh, cause me to be distracted if I was trying to follow Twitter at the same time. So that was the first, was there you have an example of Matt Walsh, Roman Catholic, how does that impact our understanding of who a Christian is? Because I have said, and I've, I've never been given reason to abandon this, exegetically anyways, I've been given a lot of emotional relationship arguments. But exegetically, I have never been given a reason to abandon this. A little, little more light in. It's getting dark uh, here in London. Um, and that is that... I believe that there are saved people um, in the Roman Catholic Church, but they are saved in spite of Rome's gospel, not because of it. Um, they may have heard a simple message of Christ. They may think that's what's being said in the church. Um, I am not going to limit God's grace in that way. There are some people who just simply say, hey, if you walk to the door of that church, you're going to hell, that's it, just flush them. 
there are a lot of people that do that. There's no question about that. Um, but I can have the hope that there are simple saints uh, who hold to a simple yet sufficient, and this could be important, what is a sufficient gospel over against a insufficient gospel? What is the difference between a false gospel and an insufficient gospel? Uh, what is the difference between a person who seeks to fully understand all of gospel truth and consistently make application and the person who has traditions that interfere with their being able to do that? And is there any one of us that does not have some tradition that impacts our understanding to some point of falsity? The idea of doctrinal perfectionism uh, is another issue we'll we'll look at. Second example, as I said there are three. First, Matt Walsh on cross politics. Um, second example, Serene Jones, Dr. Serene Jones of Union Theological Seminary. Um, I I'm 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 in the future <laughs> right now, eight hours ahead of of uh, home. So uh, I was seeing the Nicholas Kristoff, Serene Jones stuff even before the briefing this morning from uh, Albert Muller that read from some of the portions of the article, which were absolutely amazing, unless you know liberalism. If you know liberalism, then reading the Serene Jones stuff where basically God really isn't a divine, isn't a being, but it's sort of, a, it's sort of almost the force and uh, Jesus just happens to look a lot like Serene Jones. And, uh, you know, this physical rising of the dead thing, that's just, you know, that, that, that never happened. And the virgin birth thing, everything. If you want to see where social justice ends up going, how it perverts every element of Orthodox Christianity, just look to Serene Jones. Look to, Orthodox, look to the Union Theological Seminary. This is, this is the fulfillment of Machen's uh, book, uh, The Reality. Uh, that truly, without question, uh, liberalism is a different religion than Christianity. Union Theological Seminary is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a Christian seminary. It is a seminary of humanistic liberalism. It's a different religion. They have no resurrection. They have no meaningful crucifixion. They have, they've got nothing. Um, and that's why they all die. And that's why Union, for example, has they don't get enough students to stay alive from the old uh, dying mainline seminaries. And so what have they done? They have uh, chosen to become uh, fully involved in the promotion of the social justice stuff, which is why just a matter of days after the, the statement of social justice came out, they came out with their, car their counter articles, which started with what? The Bible's not an error. <laughs> Let's just start from there. Um, uh, so uh, I won't go into too much more of that. I was actually going to read some of the, some of the material, but I've already taken too much time. Um, if you listen to this morning's uh, briefing, uh, it's Monday, um, you will hear uh, Albert Muller talking about Serene Jones. And again, um, this is one of the reasons why, in God's providence, I um, had to... Uh, go to Fuller Theological Seminary for my first master's degree. Um, yes, I got great education, had a number of professors that I had had at Grand Canyon, so they, they weren't all just a bunch of wild-eyed liberals. Um, but I had to be exposed to liberalism and learn how liberals think uh, because I've had to deal with that apologetically now for decades. And I am thankful. It wasn't enjoyable at the time, but I'm thankful now that that's, um, that's what I had to go through at that particular point in time. So here you have someone who claims to be a Christian, who claims to be a Protestant minister. She's not a Protestant. She's not a minister. And she's not a Christian. Um, and upon what basis do I say? She rejects the God of the Bible, the Jesus of the Bible, the crucifixion, the resurrection, every element of historic Orthodox faith is denied by this woman. Matt Walsh is considerably closer to the truth than Serene Jones ever could be seen as being close to the truth, but by any stretch of the definition. Um, the problem is people really struggle to make these distinctions 
um, and especially people with a fundamentalistic mindset. They'll just throw Walsh and Serene Jones in the same pot. You can't do that. You cannot, you cannot come up with that. That's, that's impossible. If you don't make it, this, if you can't intelligently discuss and function within the categories that would allow you to understand the differences between Serene Jones and Matt Walsh, you will never be able to be used to reach either one of them. And that's one of the major problems. One of the major problems with the application of fundamentalist mindset is that um, these individuals are rarely concerned about reaching these folks. I've seen people come out of liberalism to embrace Orthodox Christian truth. I've seen many people come out of Roman Catholicism to engage, to embrace Orthodox biblical, biblical truth, to walk in the light, to honor the scriptures as the word of God and to follow Jesus Christ and his lordship. You have to, if, if you don't want to reach those people, then you can just simply throw them all into, you know, into one big basket if you want to. But if you actually want to encounter them, you have to, you have to make proper category distinctions. As that leads to the third of the, um, of the issues, uh, the third thing that, that uh, I brought up that, that I was looking at, I ran across um, a discussion. Um, Turretin fan, uh, my friend Turretin fan, <laughs> um, had posted an article on Facebook because I was being criticized uh, for not dealing with Arminianism. And, and everybody was like, uh, yeah, I guess you yeah, haven't looked at his books and debates and stuff like that. But it's a different context. And an individual started commenting uh, on that particular Facebook um, article. And I felt like what he said was so useful in illustrating this third perspective. And these are people who are more Calvinistic than Calvin, much more Calvinistic than Calvin, who would be embarrassed by Calvin's willingness to interact with people who did not cross the T's and dot the I's exactly as they think they should be. Um, uh, he was obviously way too liberal for most of these folks. But a fellow up in uh, Denver by the name of Ron Underwood uh, responded to uh, Turretin fan. He said, I'm just going to read you. James White is an Arminian in Calvinist clothing. And what comes out of his mouth concerning considering Arminian's brethren confirms what he actually believes in his heart, that the false universal atonement gospel and failed Christ is still, in his mind, the power of God and the salvation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, idle words, contradictions, blasphemy, idolatry, and an outright denial and rejection of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and what his death actually accomplished. And James, James's cowardly lackey, Francis Turretin, has to use a pseudonym for his own name. What a coward. See the similarities in how they hide their faces like their Muslim terrorists and counterparts who they consider their mentors? Disgusting. Now, not exactly the way to start. Normally, I would just simply block someone like that, ignore it because they're just obviously filled with hate and imbalanced and you know, stuff like that. Um, and you know where they're getting half their stuff. When someone, when someone uses the term mentor, you know they're getting it from Brandon House. And you know they're referring back to the fact that I very plainly, openly admitted that I actually have taken time to learn about Islam, even from Muslims. And that in listening to Yasser Qadi's uh, lectures, his Arabic pronunciation was excellent and extremely useful, so on and so forth. And I think at one point I used the term, I had learned much from him, mentor. And for this mindset, that's impossible. You, no Christian should ever learn about Islam from a Muslim. Now, we all sit back and go, well, you know, it's probably best to learn heart surgery from a heart surgeon. Yeah, yeah, right. They're, they're, yeah. But most of these folks, again, it's a fundamentalist mindset. And the fundamentalist mindset, you, you're not allowed to do that. Um, first-hand knowledge, direct knowledge, direct study of original sources, 
utilization of interaction with people. No, you're, you, no, you just read Christian books written by somebody else about that stuff. And that'll, that, that'll be enough. Um, which results of course, in the fact that they have zero impact, um, amongst these, these people, which is understandable. Um, but, uh, then there was, and I, I had had these all up, I'm sorry, but then I had to reset my system. Um, then this next comment, uh, Francis Turretin, he considers them brethren, which means he believes that that false gospel saves. Doesn't matter if he claims to be a Calvinist, doesn't even matter if he says Arminianism is heresy like R.C. Sproul. Can you not see the contradiction? It's irreconcilable, nonsensical, double talk. A child can see it. Can you for one second just set aside the exaltation of men and your preacher worship and look at this through the lens and logic of scripture? What's more important to you? Fallible men and their ministries to the glory and honor of Christ. Is James White more important to you than the Lord Jesus Christ? And this is, again, this, this fellow is pretty aggressive. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you hear it. Um, but then here was the most important one. And this was, come on, bring it up. There we go. And this is the one I responded to. Um, speaking to Francis Torres, he says, anyone can claim to be a Calvinist and yet deny it by what comes out of their mouths. All Arminians are lost and need to be evangelized. And most Calvinists are lost why? But listen to why. Because they have divorced the gospel and the main thing, the righteousness of God as revealed in the gospel and what the death of the Lord Jesus Christ actually accomplished from the very doctrines of grace they claim to believe in. I was a lost five-point Calvinist for over 10 years. There it is. There's the statement. I had gotten through all the other nastiness to see that, and it's, it's important. I was a lost five-point Calvinist for over 10 years. Until when? Until he came to understand, to reach that level of enlightenment. And he denies this, but this is what I call doctrinal perfectionism. That is, there is a level of doctrinal perfectionism you must attain to before you're truly a Christian. And it's not just the five points. It even goes beyond that. It's, it's evidently recognizing that all Arminians are lost and that they need to be evangelized. You need to get every Arminian uh, to believe in, in particular redemption. They have to accept uh, the doctrine of limited atonement. And if they don't, they're just they're going to hell. And, and no person evidently in the history of the church has ever been saved who did not confess limited atonement. Um, that, so I, I responded and said, you know what? I, I will try to remember to go over your comments on the dividing line as a warning to others who may confuse DPism, doctrine of perfectionism, with Christianity. To which he responded, I'm not afraid of you or your bullying tactics and your response is telling. In building and burning your straw man of doctrinal perfectionism here, you claim victory through blatant dishonesty and misrepresentation. How by refusing to debate Sonny Hernandez and openly lying about something I do not hold to doctrinal perfection as a condition of salvation. Consequently, now, how you avoid this is the issue. Consequently, you are now taking this to the DL to accuse saints of the living God and draw disciples unto yourself by telling your audience what we believe apart from engaging us. This is disturbingly underhanded. For the record, I nor anyone has ever claimed doctrinal perfection as a condition of salvation. James, salvation isn't conditioned upon doctrinal perfection, but upon Christ. Okay, if that's true, then what do you do with the person who professes faith in Christ, believes that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, that only by God's grace can anyone be saved, but does not believe in particular redemption, believes in universal atonement. Oh, well, that means they're not really trusting in Christ. 
Oh, no, wait a minute. So you have a specific formulation that you demand that they accept. And if they don't accept it, then they're not believing in Christ. Right? Now, right here, here is where the challenge comes in. Because why couldn't someone say that what Ron Underwood is doing is the same thing that Paul did um, when he wrote to the Corinthians and warned against false Christs? Similarly, in Colossians, warning against these Jesuses that would not save. Isn't that just a narrow formulation? And we're just being consistent and making other narrow formulations? I mean, I believe in particular redemption. I've defended it. I've, I've explained it from uh, Hebrews and Romans 8 and 9 and um, did the long discussion with Michael Brown about it just a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I've never shied away from, from defending this. So am I the inconsistent one for defending something as being biblically consistent? See, I believe that the deity of Christ is biblically consistent. I believe that particular redemption is biblically consistent. So why would I embrace a person who, why would I reject anyone who rejects the preexistence of Christ, the deity of Christ, et cetera, et cetera, on the one hand, but accept as a believer someone who ex denies particular redemption, someone who believes in universal atonement. The argument is that's inconsistent. You've got to, you've got to either deny both or accept both. That's the argument. And of course, the, the issue is biblical. Um, I can show you and have in the passages that we looked at. You deny Christ came in the flesh, antichrist. Um, you have a, a Jesus other than the Jesus we've proclaimed to you. Doesn't exist. Uh, Jesus is the creator of all things. Straightforward biblical teaching on all these things. When it comes to the gospel, what element of the gospel is made non-negotiable by Paul? What unifies us as believers? Justification by faith. The fact there's only one righteousness that saves. There is not a different righteousness for one group or another group. It's not for Jews or Gentiles or Scythians or barbarians. And that's why the social justice stuff is so dangerous is because they're dividing right along those very lines. But that's the element of the gospel. Grace alone, faith alone. That is made the determining factor. Now, would I say that consistently, that consistently, if you really understand grace alone, then you're going to have to recognize that faith has to be the gift of God? Well, that's going to require you to have a, a whole concept of, of biblical anthropology. It's going to take you time to understand the prophetic message, starting with the Old Testament all the way in the New Testament through Romans 1. Are we really going to say that you have to basically have a Bible scholar's knowledge of the interconnectedness of all of these things to become a Christian initially? Or is this what we, are, what we understand to be growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is a vast difference between having a heart that desires to know his truth and is willing to be... Um, molded by biblical categories of revelation and someone like uh, Serene Jones that has no interest whatsoever, none in biblical authority, in an external source of authority, but is instead her own authority. All the difference in the world. And so... Let me use this illustration. Um, I'm sure that I could ask Ron Underwood uh, a number of theological questions 
then I could trip him up about perichoresis and Trinitarian theologies and, and, uh, uh, Eutychianism and Nestorianism. I mean, there's, 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 there's tricky stuff there. And I could probably uh, trick him into saying something heretical in in-depth Trinitarian theology. Wouldn't be difficult to do with almost anyone. With almost anyone. Uh, does that mean he's been lost that entire time because he has doctrinal imperfections? And if that doctrinal imperfection does not disqualify you, why would these other doctrinal imperfections disqualify you? This is why when people say, well, you know, I really wasn't born again until I learned the five points, I just cringe because I followed Jesus as my savior when I still had fundamentalistic traditions that at first made me just dismiss the concept of particular redemption out of hand. It was, it was, it was strange. It was different. I had never heard or seen anything like that before. And so that's, you know, that's, that, that's not right. Did I lose my salvation? Was I not saved until I figured out the consistency? But the reality is I accepted particular redemption before I really fully understood um, all of the deep biblical foundation behind it. I accepted particular redemption before I had worked through the Hebrews passages on the high priest and things like that. So was I partially saved and I got more saved or was I not saved until I really got the, the deep part of it or exactly how does any of that work? Where did the apostles ever function this way? You see, the reality is when you look at their analysis of the uh, gospel, there are non-negotiables. Then there is revelation that goes far beyond those non-negotiables. And if we desire to glorify God, we will want to learn those things and understand those things and embrace those things. And we should always, I am always challenging my non-reformed brethren, to think through, to the glory of God, what they believe and where there are traditions that are getting in their way. And I just, I want to be used of the Lord to graciously press them on these issues. I want to be used as a, as a gracious, loving tool in their life. And I don't think saying they need to be evangelized is being a gracious and loving tool. I don't think saying that they are actually enemies of God and enemies of Jesus Christ. And if they die in this state, they're going to go to hell is useful or truthful. And in fact, I find it dangerous, very dangerous. So those are the three per perspectives. I almost got too far into that one to, to, to go. Okay, so there, there's, here's our three examples. We've got Matt Walsh, Roman Catholic. We've got Serene Jones, allegedly Protestant, but not by any stretch of the imagination, not historically speaking, um, not even Christian theistically speaking. Um, and then we've got Ron Underwood, um, fire-breathing, five-point Calvinist, if you don't believe in the five points, you're going to hell in a handbasket. Asserting that if I recognize that I have had to grow and that in fact I need to continue to grow, I will listen to others and I will appreciate what I hear and grow in my understanding of the interrelatedness and the harmony of Reformed theology. 